Hello everyone and welcome to this month's webinar on mental health in the workplace. This free webinar is available exclusively for our customers enrolled in our subscription services. I'm Leon Frierson, the Publications Coordinator for Personnel Concepts, and I'm joined by my co-moderator Karen Jonas, who serves as our Regulatory Monitoring Manager. Hello everyone. Today's speaker is Jessica M. Merlet, an international attorney barred in the states of Illinois, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. Before launching her own practice, Ms. Merlet served as a tender and defense counsel for the Southeastern United States for a large Fortune 500 mass retailer, providing her with extensive experience in litigation and legal consulting. Ms. Merlet's current focus includes serving as general counsel to small and mid-sized clients, providing guidance in areas such as employment law, business transactions, e-commerce and compliance, and privacy. Ms. Merlet received her JD from the University of Illinois, graduating cum laude and receiving the law school's highest merit scholarship. She has received awards for her excellence in legal writing, legal analysis, legal advocacy, and her teaching skills. Thank you, Jessica, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I think that today's topic of mental health in the workplace is particularly beneficial in that it is a sensitive issue that many employers are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Definitely. We are looking forward to discussing it with you. Today's agenda focuses on how employers can lawfully navigate sensitive employee issues with compassion. We will begin with an overview of mental health costs in the workplace. Then we will review how employers should handle mental illness accommodation requests. We'll also explore employees' right to privacy and leave. Next, we will cover anti-discrimination and harassment considerations. And lastly, we'll cover small business best practices. The format for today's webinar features a series of questions that Karen and I will be asking to Jessica regarding mental health in the workplace. Now, well, before we begin, I wanna invite everyone in attendance to submit any questions you may have during the presentation by using the ask question feature in GoToWebinar. You can also post questions in the chat window. Most questions will be saved for the end of today's session, but those that are relevant to the subtopic being discussed will be posed where appropriate. At the end of the session, you'll have an opportunity to use the raise hand feature in GoToWebinar to pose a question directly to our guest speaker. Now, we recognize that mental health is a sensitive, divisive, and controversial topic for many Americans. All of our presenters today, myself included, will make every effort to avoid using any insensitive language or stating any personal opinions about the subject matter. We also respectfully ask that you use similar discretion if you are given an opportunity to pose a question to our guest speaker. With that, let's get started with today's presentation. So let's get start off with a poll question. Uh, we'd like to know what your top motivation is for attending this webinar. If you could please select from the following, would you like more information about accommodating mental health issues in the workplace? Would you like more information on how to avoid harassment and discrimination concerns? Uh, perhaps you have a specific concern or current concern about a mental health issue in your workplace, or would you just like some more general information about mental health issues in the workplace? Just give everybody a couple of seconds here to vote. Looks like we have some people. Um, all right, so let's uh, go ahead. It looks like we have some people still logging on, so I'm gonna close and then share these results. So it looks like about 37% of you would like more information on accommodating mental health issues in the workplace. And then a lot of people would like more information about a, um, on mental health, uh, more general information on mental health issues in the workplace. So thank you very much for that. So let's get back to our presentation. Jessica, how prevalent are mental health issues? Is it really something that employers will find themselves dealing with? Well, Karen, the exact number can be difficult to pinpoint because it is estimated that less than one third of adults with a mental illness actually seek treatment. However, according to the Surgeon General, we see that one in five adults experiences a diagnosable mental illness each year. Now, of these one in five, approximately 15% also experience a co-occurring substance abuse disorder. These disorders and their resulting stress and anxiety can result in more absenteeism from the workplace 
than actually physical injury or physical illness does each year. According to the World Health Organization, in particular, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Now, anxiety disorders and depression are the most common types of mental illness, and we see that they affect nearly 40 million Americans, or around 18% of the population. Employees who may have an anxiety disorder are more likely to turn down a promotion or another opportunity because it involves travel or public speaking. These employees may socialize less with their colleagues and their clients, and they may be unable to meet deadlines. When anxiety and depression combine, as we see frequently occurs, the cost to employers is particularly high, and we have an estimated 30% of heart attacks actually correlating directly to such mental illnesses. And uh, does this directly impact employers from a cost perspective? It does, Leon. So on average, employees suffering from depression continue to take around 9.86 sick days per year, which is significantly more than any other major medical condition. And in light of these lost work days, the toll that mental health related issues can take on employers is staggering. So with mental illness and substance abuse, we see that that cost employers an estimated 80 to 100 billion in annual indirect costs and 26 billion in direct treatment costs per year. Now, these costs are as great or even greater than the cost of medical and disability payments for employees who are suffering from other medical conditions, such as hypertension, from diabetes, back problems, or heart disease. Now, furthermore, workers who are under the age of 40 are even more likely to miss work due to a mental illness. And so as the population ages, we do anticipate that this association between mental illness and lost work indicates that indirect costs to employers will only increase. And this is supported by the increased number of mental illnesses uh, that we have coming from short-term disability claims. And these are growing by 10% annually. Currently, they account for around 30% of all corporate disability costs for employers. In 2016, which is the year that we have the most recent statistics for, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC, as we'll refer to it in this webinar, reported that it received approximately 5,000 claims based on mental illness issues alone. And this resulted in damages of around $20 million to employers. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, what challenges to, do employers face when implementing health, mental health initiatives? Well, unfortunately, Karen, employers have been quite historically reluctant to invest in mental health initiatives. And that's due to three factors. So first, there are misconceptions regarding whether mental health treatment is cost effective. Second, there's a lack of information about the costs and the tolls that mental illness may have on the workplace. And third, there's a simple general wariness and prejudice regarding mental health. So in light of these statistics, though, that we've already discussed and the growing number of claims that the EEOC is seeing, employers really are encouraged to reevaluate their initiatives and to reform their thinking away from this historical reluctance. Uh, they're encouraged to place as high of a priority on mental health as employers may be are doing on physical health so that there are lower medical costs, that there's less turnover and absenteeism, and overall greater productivity. Now, there's no denying that America is slowly starting to take note of the importance of mental health. And while mental health has long been recognized as protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA, the EOC did recently take some formal steps to provide guidance to employers and to employees as to these ADA measures. 
Thanks, Jessica. Now, mental health is a broad term used to encompass a number of illnesses, but could you give us a more specific definition of mental illness? Absolutely, Leon. So several laws do impact and protect employees who are suffering from mental illnesses. So chief among these is the ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act, as I just mentioned. And in the ADA, we define mental illness and a protected person under the law as meeting one of the following three criteria. So first, having a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities of the individual. Or, second, having a record of such an impairment. Or, third, not even having a record, but simply being regarded as having such an impairment. Now, a mental impairment is defined under the ADA as, I will quote here, any mental or psychological disorder, such as mental retardation, organic brain syndrome, emotional or mental illness, and specific learning disabilities. Thank you, Jessica. What are some examples of mental disorders that employers may encounter with their employees? Well, of course, there's a wide range, Karen. Uh, but some of the more prevalent ones that we see in the workplace include anxiety and depression, which are the most common, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. We also see post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. Now, earlier, Jessica, you made a reference to the EEOC's recent guidance. Could you review um, that for us and how it ties into mental health in the workplace? Sure. So since 1997, the EEOC has recognized the ADA's importance uh, in the context of mental health in the workplace. The new guidance is broader than the previous guidance, and it does recognize illnesses uh, be it temporary illnesses or permanent illnesses that, quote, substantially limit an employee's daily life. So such as that employee's ability to concentrate, to interact with others, uh, to communicate, to eat, to sleep, to care for themselves, to regulate thoughts or emotions, or to do, quote, any other major life activities. Now, conditions that may make tasks more difficult, uncomfortable, or time-consuming, which is what we frequently see in the context of mental illness, would qualify under uh, would qualify as a substantial impairment under the EEOC's new and broader interpretation of the ADA. Now, not every impairment, of course, does constitute a substantial limitation. Therefore, careful consideration is really required by both the employer and the employee, and the burden is on the employee to demonstrate that that substantial impairment does exist. Are there other workplace laws that employers should be aware of that protect individuals with mental health issues? Of course, and there are quite a number of them, in fact. Uh, they include the ADA, uh, which we've already discussed, there's also the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act of 2008, which amends that 1990 ADA. There's the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993, which most employers will be familiar with. And then, of course, there are state and local laws as well. Right. So, so if an employer does have an employee with a mental illness, are they required to make accommodations for them in the workplace? Well, that depends. So if an employer knows that an employee qualifies as having a mental illness under the ADA, the employer must make a reasonable accommodation if requested, really the same as if that employee was suffering from a physical illness or a physical injury. Now, employers, though, are not required to make reasonable accommodations for persons 
whom they don't know are suffering from a mental illness or where that person doesn't request that an accommodation be made. Now, it's important for employers to note that reasonable accommodation requests really are not limited to mental illnesses that severely impact an employee's ability to perform, but rather, as we discussed under those new EEOC guidelines, uh, it's broader, and that can extend to anything that makes performing the work more difficult, more uncomfortable, or more time-consuming. Thank you, Jessica. Before we move into the next section, I would like to ask another question of our audience. Have you ever offered a reasonable accommodation to an employee based on illness, either physical or mental? So like we were talking about with the different accommodations, have you ever allowed somebody to come in later to work because they had some kind of disability? Uh, we're interested in hearing your responses. So thank you for voting on this. All right, we'll keep waiting here. It looks like more of you are voting. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and share the results. Most of you have offered a reasonable accommodation based on illness. So this is definitely interesting and you'll definitely wanna keep listening to our presentation. Now, Jessica, what are some examples of reasonable accommodations that employers might offer to their employees who are dealing with a mental health issue? Well, unlike physical impairments, it can be difficult to assess what accommodations may actually be reasonable for an employee who is suffering from a mental illness. And so for that reason, employers and mentally ill employees really must work closely together to determine an accommodation that is right for the circumstance and for the illness. So such considerations may include a determination by the employer of the primary requirements for the position, and also a determination by the employee of his or her functional limitations, meaning how the disability makes it hard for that person to meet the primary requirements or the demands of the position. So for example, it may be that an employee takes medication that impacts his or her memory or concentration or perhaps has an impact on the employee's relationships, emotions, or maybe time management skills. So that would be something for the employee to determine. Now, reasonable accommodations, they can also directly impact businesses' bottom lines. Uh, Boston College, whom we'll discuss a few times in this webinar, it has conducted some research under a grant from uh, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, the long name there. And Boston College determined that uh, most accommodations for psychiatric disabilities actually cost employers less than $100 to implement. But on average, employers see $28.69 in benefits for every dollar that was invested in making such an accommodation. Now, it's important for employers to note that employees cannot be asked for to cannot be asked to pay for the expense in providing an accommodation. Uh, nor, though, is an employer required to provide an accommodation if doing so would be unreasonably expensive. Now, we have some examples here from the ADA that are good ideas uh, for ways to accommodate people who have mental illnesses. We'll go through some of these. So for example, an employer could provide a self-paced workload or could provide flexible hours to accommodate side effects of medication, for example. An employer could modify job responsibilities, so assign filler duties to another employee. An employer could allow leave, whether it be paid leave or unpaid leave, during periods of hospitalization or periods of incapacity. 
an employer can modify work hours to allow employees to attend appointments with um, medical providers or mental health providers. Uh, employers can provide specialized equipment, so such as assistive devices, or uh, can give instructions, for example, via email instead of verbally. And one that we frequently see implemented is that employers can modify work sites to minimize distractions, so such as using wall partitions. Thanks again, Jessica. Now, what happens if an employer grants the accommodation, but the employee still isn't able to perform their job duties? That's a great question. So it's important for employers to note that really nothing in the ADA or the guidelines, new ones or the old ones, require that an employer continue to employ someone who simply cannot perform the duties of the job even where a reasonable accommodation is made. So nor is an employer required to rewrite job duties or requirements for the job past eliminating what would be considered perhaps non-primary duties. Uh, employers are not required to continue to employ persons who perform poorly, nor are they required to continue to employ persons who behave inappropriately even if such inappropriate behavior actually stems from the disability. And notwithstanding this, an employer who is trying to make a determination as to whether or not someone could be terminated and where we know that that employee does have a mental illness or where that employee has put in a request for reasonable accommodation, of course, the employer is really, really highly encouraged to first speak with uh, its local labor and employment council before making any decision. Thanks again. And um, we do have a question from Dan in the audience. Uh, I'll just read it quickly. How and when do we approach an employee who is exhibiting signs of mental illness? And can we directly ask them if they're suffering from mental illness? Dan, I believe your question will be answered in the next two sections. So listen, um, listen in closely. Um, and just moving along, Jessica, uh, mental health is such a sensitive issue that's often difficult to discuss with an employee, even when an employer suspects that there is an issue. Uh, what do you suggest? suggest that employers do in those situations. So Leon and Dan, here you go. Here is part of the answer and the other part will come a little bit later. So as we discussed, mental illness is really highly stigmatized. And as a result of this, employees uh, frequently are really quite reluctant to discuss their mental illnesses with their employers, even if that mental illness is affecting their job performance. And uh, as with any condition, a physical condition or a mental condition, employees really oftentimes fear that there will be retaliation, that there will be discrimination, that they may be terminated, or if it's the beginning of the hiring phase that they simply won't be hired if they discuss their mental illness or let it become known. Um, so employers really are encouraged to educate their managerial staff on how to identify and how to watch for signs of mental illness. So some of the ways that we can identify and, and watch for signs of mental illness include the fact that oftentimes these employees will have a marked personality change that happens over time. Uh, we see employees with mental illness uh, having a decreased interest or involvement in their own work. Uh, we have consistent late arrivals um, or frequent absences. Like we said, mental illness does affect uh, or impact absenteeism more than anything else in the workplace. Uh, these employees frequently socially withdraw. They may be less friendly or they may be increasingly uh, self-centered. Employers uh, frequently have more complaints of fatigue or unexplained pains. And we see that uh, such employees who maybe are suffering from a mental illness are demonstrating heightened anxieties, fears, uh, anger, suspicion, um, or maybe have a tendency to more frequently blame others instead of uh, take responsibility for themselves. So Jessica, once an employer suspects that an issue exists, can they discuss it with the employee? So, well, an employee is, of course, entitled to privacy regarding uh, his or her mental illness. 
but employers are entitled to ask employees about a known mental illness or a perceived mental illness in the following four very limited circumstances. And these are the four circumstances that the EEOC has acknowledged in its recent guidelines. So first, employers can ask if a reasonable accommodation should be made where that employer knows the employee has a mental illness. So for example, if we have an employee who has a history of depression and who appears to be suffering from a depressive episode, that employee, that employer may ask the employee directly if an accommodation could be made without violating that employee's right to privacy. Secondly, employers may ask about job candidates' mental health histories after an offer has been made, but before employment begins, so long as all candidates for the same job category are asked these same questions, and so long as the questions being asked relate to the job. Uh, third, employers who may have an affirmative action program for people with disabilities may inquire about employees' mental health, uh, such as an employer who tracks the disability status of its applicant pool, uh, in order to assess whether its recruitment or its hiring efforts are in line with its programs. Now, in such a circumstance, though, employees cannot be required to respond to such questions. And finally, employers may ask about an employee's mental health if there's objective evidence that the employee is unable to perform the job or may be posing a safety risk to himself or to others. So in such a circumstance, the employer really must make an individualized assessment of that person's present ability to safely perform the essential functions of the job. And using a reasonable medical judgment that relies on the most current medical knowledge or on the best available objective evidence. And I want to add something here as well, that if you have an employee who maybe is posing or, or seems to be posing a safety risk, you also have the duty to other employees in the workplace to investigate that a little bit further as well. Thank you there. And, um... So, Jessica, what if the employee has disclosed that they do have a mental illness? Can an employer ask for medical documentation of that illness? So, if a mental illness does exist, and if that mental illness has been disclosed, employers have the right to ask for documentation of the disability. Insofar as asking about the nature of the functional limitations, that the disability causes and how those may interfere with job performance. An employer also has the right to ask about accommodations that maybe will assist. Uh, that being said though, employers are prohibited from asking for records, uh, medical records, from asking for a diagnosis, from asking about the history of the illness, treatment plans, or any other type of information that's unrelated to the workplace or to job performance. And are there any other privacy guidelines that you'd recommend employers to follow? Well, Leon, in general, I'd really advise employers to remember that employees who wish to take advantage of the laws that protect them, so such as the ADA or the FMLA, those employees have to disclose their conditions to their employers. Um, employers are not required to act or to provide assistance in circumstances where an employee has not come forward. So it isn't up to the employer to go around to trying to identify employees with a mental illness or to be questioning employees about their mental health. Uh, they're better off really waiting until the employee themselves uh, has disclosed the information. Again, of course, uh, that risk to others exception. Now, 
if an employer does receive information about a mental illness, the employer has to keep that information uh, strictly confidential. The same, of course, as an employer would do with uh, information related to a physical illness. In general, uh, the fact that an illness even exists should only be disclosed to the person who's directly involved with providing an accommodation and maybe to safety and risk managers or to uh, EEOC-related HR managers. And then, of course, diagnosis or a need for accommodation must be kept separate from that employee's personnel file. Now, we also have the consideration that if an employee wishes to disclose uh, his mental illness to coworkers, an employer can't prohibit or can't prevent that employee from doing so. So if an employee decides though to not disclose the mental illness, we do see that frequently questions maybe arise as to why that employee is uh, perhaps allowed to come in later than other employees. So a uh, tip for employers who are facing such questions, because of course the employer is not allowed to disclose that uh, mental illness exists or that reasonable accommodations are being made. Uh, the employer is advised to state simply that it is following employment laws and that it supports all employees in doing their jobs. Jessica, what options do employees who are experiencing a mental illness have if they need to take a leave of absence from work while they recover? Well, in addition to workplace leave policies that employers may already have in place, some employers may be provided, or maybe, I'm sorry, required to provide some additional leave for mental illness related issues under that FMLA or the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993. And that is going to apply to uh, employees who have worked a cumulative minimum of 12 months over the last seven years for that employer and a minimum of 1,250 hours in the 12 months directly prior to the leave request. Now the FMLA applies to private employees with at least uh, private employers with at least 50 employees and within 75 miles of the requesting employees work site. Uh, it also of course applies to all government agencies and to federal employees. Uh, while smaller employers may not be covered by the M FMLA, uh, there are several states that have passed quite similar legislation uh, sometimes the legislation is even stricter, uh, stronger than the FMLA, and it may apply. Now, although it doesn't specifically require that accommodations be made for mental illness, the FMLA does provide for 12 weeks of unpaid leave in the event of illness. And that leave may be used as a form of reasonable accommodation. It's important to note that the FMLA does provide for leave not only for mental illness, but it also provides leave if that employee needs to care for a spouse, a child, or a parent who may be suffering from a mental illness as well. Thanks again for that great information, Jessica, on leave. and. Um, Moving forward, I do have, uh, we do have another poll question for our audience, if you guys can answer quickly here. Uh, the question is, have you offered leave or as a reasonable ac accommodation in the past? So have you offered leave as a reasonable accommodation in the past? Your options are yes, no, or not sure. If you can go ahead and log your responses, please. Just a few more seconds. All right, we're gonna go ahead and close now and we'll see what the audience came up with. Looks like a majority have offered leave, about 60% compared to 21 that haven't and 19% that are not sure. Um, so just moving along here, Jessica, I know we discussed this as it pertains to privacy, but if an employee is requesting FMLA leave to attend to a mental 
attend to a mental illness, is an employer permitted to ask for medical documentation? Right, so similar to those privacy considerations that we discussed, employers who are considering uh, an FMLA leave request, those employers are not entitled to know a diagnosis, they're not entitled to receive medical records or treatment plans, et cetera. What an employer is entitled to receive is information that is sufficient to determine if the leave request is even covered by the FMLA. Now, if an employee fails to provide sufficient information to make that determination, uh, it's on the employee and the employee may not be protected. So are employers required to give employees who are returning from leave their same jobs back? So upon returning to work after an FMLA absence for a mental illness, uh, employers are required to give an employee the same or a nearly identical job with the same or substantially similar duties and responsibilities and status. That job must have the same general or require the same general level of skill, effort, uh, responsibility, and authority. The job must offer identical pay as well as premium pay, overtime pay, bonus opportunities. The job has to offer identical benefits, uh, and it has to offer around the same general work schedule and be at the same or at least a nearby location. Now, it's important to note that employers are not required to reinstate employees who maybe exhaust their leave entitlements, nor are they required to reinstate uh, teachers or key employees um, who are defined as salaried FMLA eligible employees who are among the highest paid 10% of the employees who work for that employer. Now, furthermore, even if employers are, are not covered by the FMLA, so they don't have enough uh, employees, for example, they may wish to revisit their leave policies to allow for some additional leave in order to treat mental illness, uh, again, as a way to provide a reasonable accommodation. And as we mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, the statistics really firmly support that the cost of mental illness on a workplace can be very much mitigated through treatment and management. In one example, we see that nearly 86% of employees who are treated for depression with a medication do report improved work performance. So it does have an effect. Uh, now, employers who are facing an FMLA leave request are encouraged, of course, to contact their local labor and employment council and to do this immediately because the FMLA has very strict timing and notice deadlines with which employers must comply. Now, recently we've seen the EEOC more closely analyzing whether mental health can qualify an individual for an accommodation or for a leave request. And in late 2017, we are seeing that the commission found an individual who had difficulty sleeping as a result of her, of her mental illness and where she was taking some medication. She had been given a flexible reporting time of between 8 and 9.30 in the morning. Um, and the commission found that that was not a reasonable enough accommodation because her disability actually kept her frequently to be oversleeping even beyond this flexible time frame. So we do see there that the EEOC is very strongly considering what kind of accommodations are reasonable in the context of mental health and placing a priority on that at the moment. Uh, now, Jessica, I know a lot of employers may be apprehensive about hiring someone with a mental illness. Is it permissible for employers to inquire about an applicant's mental health in the hiring phase so that they can rule out candidates with a mental illness? Mm -hmm. Leanne, so that's a great question. And as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, uh, there are some ways that employers can ask about this. 
But much the same as any protected class, employers cannot be discriminating against individuals who have a mental illness, and that discrimination cannot be at any time during the employment process, so during the hiring, during the retention, or during the firing phases of employment. Uh, however, employers um, can ask about candidates' ability to perform the job. Um, but it cannot uh, ask about a mental illness or just general questions about candidates' medical or psychiatric history. So instead, much the same as asking if a laborer can perform physical tasks that may be necessary for uh, building a house, um, a, an employer may ask about a candidate's ability to work with others uh, that candidate's ability to travel, for example, or to adhere to deadlines. That being said, though, of course, overly inquisitive employers may really quickly find themselves facing an EEOC discrimination claim. Now, employers must also take measures to prevent harassment in the workplace that may occur against mentally ill employees. And we really encourage employers to implement sort of judgment-free grievance reporting and training opportunities that directly are related to mental illness harassment. The same as employers are ready to do or should be doing for sexual harassment, race-based harassment, or other types of harassment. Now, the EEOC has recently taken a much stronger position related to individuals in particular with learning disabilities. And we've seen the EEOC filing lawsuits against staffing agencies, including ADECO, which some of our listeners may be familiar with. ADECO had deemed it that a candidate was too slow for the job when that candidate asked for um, a pre-hiring examination to be read to him um, because of his difficulty with reading comprehension. And the EEOC charged that ADECO had violated that worker's, uh, that candidate's rights under the ADA by refusing to hire him for the type of work he desired because there was this perceived disability, the perceived disability that he was too slow. So Jessica, this has been a very informative presentation on the basics of what employers can do to address mental health in the workplace. Do you have any final tips or best practices for our audience? Of course I do. So as always to end this, I do have some specific recommendations for the listeners today. So first, I really strongly encourage all employers to evaluate their current programs, uh, to revisit, to revise if necessary, their, benefit, uh, their benefits and their health programs as they relate to mental illness. So as part of this evaluation, employers may wish to try to calculate the impact that mental illness has on the workplace and to perform a business case study with managers uh, as well as maybe put in place formal guidelines to deal with accommodations and leave requests. Secondly, uh, I really encourage employers to educate their employees and to educate their managers about the impact of mental health and to uh, discuss with everyone how to be aware of mental issues and how to respond to mental illness issues. So uh, with particular focus again on depression and anxiety and the uh, co-symptom that we often have of substance abuse. Uh, we encourage all employers to offer a mental health screening, and that can be part of the education and the training related to mental health. Uh, we actually see that when mental health screenings are offered to all employees, that returns on investment have been noted to be around 1.7 to 1. So it's a great thing for employers to be doing. Of course, encouraging open communication is really always the key. Uh, with all of these uh, webinars that we discuss and all of the issues, the more that employees are encouraged to speak up and to talk to their managers if they are having an issue or having a difficult time, uh, the less impact it maybe has on the workplace. Um, we often see that employees only discuss or, or only uh, bring up their mental illness 
when they're being terminated and that's simply too late for assistance or accommodation to be provided. And finally, as always, I encourage all employers to consult with a labor and employment lawyer in their state or to talk to the EEOC if there's any questions, comments, or concerns about mental illness in the workplace. And of course, so that they can be better informed about state and local laws, which may also have an impact. Thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, now for our audience, I want to point out that raise hand feature in our in GoToWebinar. Uh, get ready to hit that hand button for this last uh, audience question. So audience, do you feel more confident in dealing with mental health issues in the workplace after this presentation? Please raise your hand if you feel that you've learned something today. We'd love to hear from you. Looks like we have quite a few people raising their hands. So I'm glad to hear that you had that you learned something for this presentation. So thank you, Jessica, for reviewing this information with us. Before we end today's session, let's take a moment to answer some questions from our audience that were submitted during the presentation. Leon will ask the questions on behalf of our attendees. All right, thanks, Karen. Uh, so yeah, in an effort to continue the education on the topic at hand today, I do have a couple questions from some audience members. I'll be reading them uh, on their behalf and uh, posing them directly to Jessica. So first off, thank you for submitting those questions. Um, I'm going to do my best to summarize questions I have from Alicia and both uh, and Brandy. So um, Jessica, Alicia asks, um, <clears throat> in here. So she has um, a part-time employee that's constantly calling out sick at the last minute due to what they are calling anxiety and depression. And um, however, the employee has not provided a request for accommodation. And when the employer asks how they can help, the employee states nothing can be done. Um, what are the risks in terminating this employee on the basis of attendance? So that's a great question and one that we really do see come up a lot. Uh, again, as we discussed, employees are quite frequently reluctant to say, hey, this is what is going on, um, to say I have anxiety or to say I have depression or, or to say whatever it is. Um, but as we've discussed, you don't have a duty to provide an accommodation unless an accommodation is requested. Uh, employers can do so if they want to or can try to do so if they want to, but it's up to the employee to come with uh, ways that an accommodation can be made. And if an employee is simply not uh, willing to, to work with you, then you don't have any, any responsibility to, to keep that employee on. And of course, there's always the, the potential for an unemployment claim, as there is with everything. but. If you have the file documented there, then then I would say that you know if there's not been an accommodation request made, you don't have any kind of duty to to continue to hold on to this employee. Of course, do talk to your local labor and employment council before making any final decision. All right, and um, just to touch on Brandy's question is almost the same scenario or slightly different scenario um, but the same type of topic here so they have a an employee that has been spoken to written up um, over the last couple weeks and was given 30 days to imp uh, improve um, that employee is now saying that they may be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder so and she's also displaying symptoms of it around her desk posting it on the walls and act acting along with them they had planned on terminating the employee after 30 days, uh, and they're just once again fearful that they may get some type of backlash. So she asked, should we be concerned about any possible lawsuit if they do terminate that employee? I think your, your concern, uh, try to work first, of course, with the employee if you want to keep them on, uh, with seeing if there's an accommodation that can be made. If we've identified what the mental illness may be, Perhaps there is a way, if that employee is I don't know, taking medication, that, uh, that the mental illness can be maintained and still the, uh, still the 
requirements of the job can be performed. But remember, for everyone that's listening, if the requirements of the job, if those uh, heart of the job requirements are not being performed, even if you've made an accommodation, if you've given time off, whatever it may be, if those are not being performed, then, then you do not have a duty to continue to work with that employee. Thank you. Um, so I do have a couple questions here from Laura. Uh, I'll start off with, she asked, can you write in a mental health leave plan that is optional for employees in your company's handbook? So if you could give any recommendations on what a mental health leave plan would look like or if that's lawful at all. So absolutely, you can write a mental health leave plan. I think that that would be a great idea, um, and that would be part of what we discussed. There at the very end, my tips, I always encourage all employers to really reevaluate their current policies, uh, to go through and, and look at their handbooks and determine, you know, what do we want to uh, do in the workplace to make it a more inclusive a friendlier and more productive workplace, right? So if you want to provide a mental health leave plan or whatever you want to call it there, go for it. But of course, remember, if you write it down in your handbook, if you do put it down as a policy, you have to be prepared to actually follow it. Uh, so do be a little bit careful there what you put in it. Um, but you, I think that that's a great idea to specifically address mental illness, to let your employees know, hey, if I'm having some difficulty, uh, whether it be uh, bipolar or whether it be depression or anxiety or any of the things that go along with that, such as uh, substance abuse, here is who I talk to, uh, here is what the employer can do, here's how I make an accommodation request, here are my options. And that is uh, for everything. That's that's really a great idea, be it for mental health, be it for sexual harassment, be it for discrimination, whatever it may be. And just to follow up again from Laura, um, just to give her a little guidance, if she were to take that route as far as making a mental health leave plan, sounds like a great idea. She um, asked about HIPAA law and how it precedes mental health and companies' regulations. So I'm guessing she's alluding to like, as far as disclosure, uh, how mental health is discussed around the workplace. Can you discuss how HIPAA law may fit into those type of scenarios? Sure, so I HIPAA is really could be an entire um, <laughs> seminar webinar on itself. Uh, so this will be brief. We discussed earlier that there are privacy issues, of course. So if an employee comes to an employer and says, I'm suffering from a mental illness, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I, I have PTSD, whatever it may be, of course, you do have to keep those records private. There's no difference between how you would treat uh, information that you're receiving or related to a mental illness than your HIPAA requirements. Um, as it relates to uh, as it relates to um, a physical illness. Now, of course, there's a, HIPAA may not necessarily apply to all employers, but if we just consider privacy in a general sense, those are your requirements. You have to keep everything in a separate personnel file. Uh, it should only be disclosed on a need-to-know basis, um, and that's that's really the basics of that. If you need to know more about uh, HIPAA or about privacy, again, do talk to your uh, employment law counsel. Perfect. I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, we um, will be sending out the presentation afterwards as far as the PowerPoint and a, a recording of what went on today. Um, I do have a question from Noelle. She asked, do you think in the future the workplace will reduce number of work hours, workload, or, or provide better benefits, vacations, uh, personal days, et cetera, to lower mental illness in the workplace? So we do did see recent EEOC guidance. Um, is there anything that you see coming down the pipeline to address mental um, health in the workplace overall, anything additional? Do I think that in America we're going to see fewer hours worked? I, I don't um, think so, uh, but who, who knows? Uh, maybe in a few decades. 
Um, but in terms of recent guidelines or, or something in the pipeline, no, uh, the EEOC doesn't tend to issue uh, to issue guidelines, you know, that quickly. It's not as though it issues something every single year related to discrimination or harassment or, or illness. Um, it did do those major updates um, in 2016, and so now we're seeing the EEOC bringing the cases or looking at those claims that are rooted in the new guidelines. Uh, so I would keep an eye on those claims because we are seeing uh, quite a lot of them, um, especially, I said, as it relates to uh, learning disabilities and, and uh, reasonable accommodations and things of that nature. Keep an eye on those. Um, maybe set an alert for those so that you can see how that's how that uh, is coming up. What we see more is on the state level uh, that the states are really taking more notice of um, uh, of allowing uh, more leave, of requiring more leave, of of uh, implementing legislation related to leave, not just for. Uh, affected employees, but for leave to take care of, as the FMLA requires, for those employees and um, children, for example, who may be having a mental illness difficulty or their spouse uh, may be suffering from uh, depression, something along those lines. So I think uh, look at the cases that the EEOC is considering and then also keep an eye on your local legislation because that's where the, uh, the changes are more likely to occur. All right. So, yeah, it sounds like we should uh, definitely pay attention to our state and local laws. Those would probably be the best way of seeing any change there. Um, so, um, first off, uh, I do want to acknowledge Courtney, Nicole, Allison, Missy. We are getting tons of questions. So thank you, guys. Um, we we uh, won't be able to answer them today because, unfortunately, we have run out of time. But all of your unanswered questions will be forwarded to Jessica via email, and her responses will be sent out to all attendees in the next coming days. So uh, make sure to look out for those, and um, if you, as long as you're here, you should be getting an email follow-up. So thanks to everyone who did submit questions about today's topic, and also thanks to you, Jessica, for taking the time to answer them. Uh, Karen? We enjoy hosting webinars for our valued customers and as such would really appreciate your feedback. Please stick around for a couple of minutes as a brief survey will open up for you to rate what you saw and heard today. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending today's presentation. We hope you found this information useful in understanding mental health in the workplace. Thanks again to Jessica for being our guest panelist. We look forward to continuing to work with Jessica on future presentations. To all of our attendees, thanks for choosing Personnel Concepts as your provider of workplace compliance solutions. Have a good afternoon, everyone.